and friends, welcome to the webinar on investment law reform, The View from Asia. My name is Stephanie Shakara and I'm pleased to open the first session of our four-day webinar. The moderator for today's session is Professor Jose Alvarez from New York University School of Law. So without further delay, we will now begin the webinar. Over to you, Professor Alvarez. Well, thank you, Stephanie, very much for that. Uh, so as the faculty director of, this, of the US Asia Law Institute here at NYU, it gives me great pleasure uh, to have this collaborative project, our second actually, with NUS's Center on International Law. Our first collaboration is on our website and recorded now on global, law ref uh, global health reform, also the perspectives from Asia. And we're thrilled to have this second uh, excuse for a collaboration. Uh, it's an ambitious uh, program that you have before you, uh, and Professor Calamita will give you further details on what to expect over the next four days. Uh, but this is just uh, uh, my way of uh, welcoming all of you. Uh, and now over back to you, uh, Stephanie. Thank you, Professor. And now we have CIL Director um, Dr. Nilifor Orel to make some welcoming remarks as well. Thank, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all. Greetings <clears throat> to all um, who have joined us today, this morning, this evening, wherever. Uh, as director of the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore, it is really my great pleasure to just make a very short welcoming comment for the CIL US Asian Law Institute Joint Conference on Investment Law Reform, The View from Asia. Uh, I have to thank our institutional partner, um, the Asian, U.S. Asian Law Institute, and in particular, Professor Jose Alvarez and Catherine Wilhelm for inviting us to join them in co-organizing this very timely and important topic. And may I say that we are absolutely delighted that this is our second collaboration, and I look forward to many more in the future. Um, I thank also, in particular, Professor Jansen Kalamita, head of the CIL Investment Law and Policy Program, and to all the outstanding panelists we have joining us for the next four days, and a special thanks also to the CIL team, Stephanie, Jerry, and Matthew. Um, our two institutions are in very different parts of the world, literally 12-hour time differences, but we share a common interest in the study and research of international law in the Asian region. The next four days devoted to the topic of investment law reform uh, by international top experts in this field uh, is a rare opportunity for this type of in-depth analysis, and I have no doubt that the outcome will be influential. So once more, my sincerest gratitude to all who have organized and who are taking part in this event, and I wish you all a very rich four days of discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Professor Janssen Kalamita to make some introductory remarks to the webinar. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I'd like to offer a, a, a brief note, a, a, an overview of our program um, and welcome. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with uh, Professor Alvarez and his colleagues at USALI uh, to bring this all together. We have a great lineup of sessions for the next four days. Um, today and tomorrow, we have panels discussing the reform efforts in international organizations and the role of Asian states uh, in those discussions, um, as well as the positions of Asian states themselves and their own bilateral practices. Then on Wednesday and Thursday, we have panels that take a step back, uh, first analyzing the character of Asian states' involvement in reform, uh, whether we see Asian states acting as makers takers or breakers of international norms and paradigms with respect to investment law reform. And then on Thursday, taking a long view as to what reform means both for the investment law regime as such, uh, but with respect to Asia in particular. Um, I'm looking forward to it as I hope you are. And so without further delay, let me pass things back to Stephanie uh, 
uh, so we can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so let's get started and I hand back to Professor Alvarez and the distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So as you just heard, uh, this first panel is basically focused on uh, laying out some of the groundwork so that everybody is on the same page. That is, the reforms of the regime are taking place in a wide variety of places, but the key places are ICSID uh, and its rule amendment procedures that is ongoing, UNCTAD uh, and its efforts to reform international investment agreements, and, and that includes uh, investor state dispute settlement within those agreements, and in and particularly in Uncentral's Working Group 3. Uh, and so we'll hear from all three of those, but we'll also hear uh, from the WTO and its uh, uh, investment facilitation efforts, uh, just to see the context of those other three, and also just to explore as to whether uh, there are other possibilities for reforming the regime. Uh, at least three of our panelists have prepared PowerPoints, so I want to get started to make sure that we uh, get through the abundant material. The whole way this will work is that the first hour will consist of each of the panelists laying out uh, their respective uh, uh, ideas within uh, UNCTAD, ICSID, Uncentral's Working Group 3, and in the WTO. And in the second hour, we'll, we'll have some interaction. Uh, with the panelists, as well as hopefully you. Uh, you have a Q&A function. You, you saw uh, the process at the beginning, uh, but just to remind you, you, you have the ability to not just write your own questions, but to prioritize. As you see other folks' questions and you want to hear particularly the answers for that, you can bump up the question up. I suspect many of you have been on Zoom long enough uh, to know how that works. At the outset, let me just uh, briefly tee up uh, the bios of the people in the order that they will speak. Uh, and of course, those bios are also up on the website. The other thing I should call attention to is thanks to two very industrious uh, students uh, at uh, 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 Center for International Law and here at US Asia Law Institute, we've put up some bibliographies focusing on uh, Asian perspectives in those particular working groups, as well as in regional organizations. Uh, those bibliographies should also be up uh, with the link for that, and I call attention to those. So first up will be to discuss ICSID. You couldn't get better than this. Uh, the Secretary General, uh, Meg Kinnear, uh, familiar to anybody who follows uh, this. Uh, she is currently, of course, ICSID Secretary General uh, for Investment Disputes at the World Bank. She was formerly the Senior General Counsel, Director General of uh, uh, the Trade Law Bureau of Canada, where she was responsible for the conduct of all international investment and trade litigation involving Canada and participated in the negotiation of bilateral investment agreements uh, in November 2002. She was named chair of the negotiating group on dispute settlement for the free trade of the Americas Agreement. She's published numerous articles on an international investment law, it is a frequent speaker on these topics. She's the co-author of International Disputes under NAFTA, published in 2006 and updated uh, uh, 2008 and 2009. She's also co-authored texts on Canadian legal procedure in, involving federal court practice uh, and the Crown Liability and Proceedings Act. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Meg. Thank you very much, Professor Alvarez. I am delighted to be here today. I only wish I could be in Singapore to do this, but I'm really glad to say hello to uh, all of our friends in Singapore and to participate. I'd like to start with uh, the PowerPoint and basically what I would like to do here is to give you an overview of the reform process in ICSID, mainly on the rules amendment, but also a word on the code of conduct, which we've been involved in. And you could not have picked, I think, a better time because uh, we will be releasing the next iteration of the rules amendment, hopefully in the next two, three days. So keep your eyes posted to that. And certainly at ICSID, we hope that this is the last working paper and that we can actually proceed 
to a vote in the next months. Obviously, that will depend on the reaction of our states, but I think we've done a huge amount of work and that we are at a very balanced and effective package and hopefully should be ready to move to a vote very soon. So timing here is perfect. Um, just by way of background, we began this in late 2016 and we have done what are known as working papers, which essentially are taking all of the sets of rules we are looking at and saying, here's the rule, here's how it could be reformed and here's draft text. So it's been a huge undertaking. We've had more than 150 consultations, presentations and meetings. We've had three week long consultations with our member states and we've done a huge amount of work to this and really worked to what I think is pretty close to consensus at this point. To get this over the hurdle, we need to have our member states vote on this. And with respect to ICSID amendments, in other words, rules that are under the convention, we need two thirds of the membership. So that would be 104 votes of the current 155 members. For the other sets of rules, uh, mediation, fact finding and additional facility, we need approval of a majority of those voting. So that's what we will be looking for. And of course, every member state at ICSID has one equal vote. So we'll simply have four resolutions covering those uh, issues. We'd obviously hope to proceed earlier, uh, but the pandemic got in our way. And in fact, uh, we were sent home about two weeks before what we thought was gonna be our last in-person consultation with states. So we've gone to more of a written format and polishing, but I think we are now ready to go and I hope that our states see that as well. Uh, in terms of the objectives of these amendments, they were obviously a number of objectives. Number one, of course, was to modernize the rules based on our experience on best practice and feedback from facility uh, users. And those would probably be a lot of the more what you'd call technical kinds of changes that we see here or sometimes wording changes to make things more clear. Uh, the last time we did this was 2006, so we felt it was time to come back and sharpen it up in terms of making these a more modern set of rules, but keeping them fit for purpose. Secondly, obviously, there's a lot of discussion, uh, call this the, the reform discussion. There are a lot of procedural issues involved in that, and we wanted to reflect some of these in the updated ICSID rules. Throughout, what's been extremely important to us is maintaining procedural balance between investors and states. So while it's only states that vote on the rules at the end of the day, and I apologize, my dog also has an opinion here. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, um, we have been very, very careful about maintaining a procedural balance because frankly, we feel if they're not balanced, they're not credible and they won't be used for the purpose necessary. Finally, one of our goals was to provide more options for dispute settlement. And in particular, the mediation rules are an effort to do that. And we hope that as people get familiar with these increased options, they'll use them not just as alternatives to arbitration, but also be able to calibrate and use, for example, mediation of a certain issue or mediation at a certain stage in the case, and to be able to use them together and in a complementary form. Our main issues, if I can boil them down, are these five. Number one, of course, is always the time and cost of arbitration. And that's an interesting issue. It's one we all talk about. Yet as we went through and did studies of where the delays are, it's hard to address just one cause of delay that you could fix. There are a number and they're often idiosyncratic depending on the case. And what we also heard from uh, members of the uh, private bar, but also from our states, is that at times they feel they need more time to do what's required. So that's a hard one to balance and get results. So we've ended up approaching that in sort of a multi-pronged way, trying to get time savings everywhere we can in the process. The next one, of course, is third-party funding, one of the most, I think, perhaps controversial ones, or I would say ones where we have a wide divergence of views. And we have approached this basically as one of disclosure of whether there is third party funding and who the funder is so that you will not have conflicts of interest between the arbitrator and the funder. 
The next question was security for costs. And we have put in a standalone security for costs rule. So we have delinked it from provisional measures, which required urgency. And it was hard to see sometimes urgency in security for costs and hard to get security for costs. I think the rule we have is quite consistent with what we're seeing arbitrators do in practice in any event. The fourth big question was transparency. Uh, ICSID was uh, a leader in this in 2006. We've subsequently had Mauritius, which has been signed by some delegations, but I think in fairness, there are still relatively few delegations that have signed on to Mauritius. And what we saw here was the necessity to increase transparency, but to a degree that members are comfortable with it. And what we tried to do was to focus on those transparency measures in particular that would increase consistency and coherence of awards. So that meant really making an effort to get awards, decisions and orders into the public domain. And then of course, the last issue being the new mechanisms in particular, a standalone set of mediation rules. So I wanted to just look a little bit about those issues. Uh, on time and cost, as I said, we took a multi-track approach to this. So first of all, what you would expect, a general duty on parties and arbitrators to expedite matters where possible. On top of that, we went to certain rules and prescribed shorter and very definite timeframes for many of these steps. So uh, to give you an example, challenge rules used to require you to act promptly was the phrase. What we now have said is that you must bring a challenge within 21 days of the relevant event happening. So that's the kind of prescribed and shorter time frame that we are looking at. One that I think is in particular important are time frames for awards and decisions. And we have put in a time frame of eight months for awards. Now that is a best efforts requirement. And in many ways, it is an ambitious requirement, but we think it's also a realistic requirement. Uh, on the procedural orders, uh, there are, are a number of different ones, but just generally, we've put in a time frame of about 60 days. So there is an effort to really sort of move things, things through the system. Uh, we have added case management conferences and tried to shift the role a bit more to arbitrators for proactive case management. As you know, one of the ethoses of arbitration has been that the case belongs to the parties. So if they want to let it sit, that's fine. Obviously, that's still true. But we have tried to have arbitrators act in a bit more proactive manner by calling together case management conferences, trying to find ways to move pieces forward. And we will see how that works. We know that's worked very well in many domestic systems. So we're hoping that that helps to uh, add to this expedition agenda. Um, I've talked about our time limits for decisions and we will be tracking whether decisions and awards actually meet those timelines. We have also gone to electronic filing. Interestingly, uh, I guess we all thought that was something that would come with our rules and we were preparing for it. The pandemic has completely fast forwarded us and quite frankly, everything now at ICSID is done by electronic filing and it's been very successful. So I don't think that is a problem and it's de facto happened. And then we have an interesting option for an expedited arbitration. In terms of expedited arbitration, we have a chapter uh, that specifically expedites. It is optional. We had originally proposed that it be mandatory but states were not comfortable with a mandatory expedited arbitration facility. So it is optional and parties can both opt in and opt out as they wish. Uh, it has a requirement of a sole arbitrator unless the parties agree otherwise. And essentially what it says is you're not going to bifurcate all of the little motions that can happen along the way. It's essentially sort of a one pipeline shoot through the process and get to a result. And if you followed it strictly, you would reduce the time of a case by about 50%. And we know now cases take between three and a half to four years. So you'd go down to about 18 months to 24 months. So that would be a significant improvement for many people. In investment, I think that is perhaps something that we will not necessarily see with a lot of the treaty cases, but it is something we think you might see with investment contract cases. And we are hoping in particular that states will want to do this where they 
um, where they uh, uh, have clauses that help small and medium sized enterprises. So we are hoping the expedited arbitration rules will be useful and will be used. On third party funding, I uh, already talked a little bit about what the process is that we have. Uh, basically, this is an area where there were views from on the one hand, complete prohibition of third party funding to on the other hand, simply leave it as it is. And so the process that we've settled on is to address the potential for conflict, but we haven't gone to any kind of a prohibition or any of that kind of a proposal. Uh, we think that this is a proposal that will be one that states are, and investors are comfortable with, and we hope that this one um, will prove to be satisfactory to get the rules through. On security for costs, as I say, this reflects a trend that we are already seeing, quite frankly, but it puts some concrete requirements to a security request. So it acknowledges the tribunal's power to issue an order for security for costs, but it has a test requiring the tribunal to take into account all relevant circumstances. So obviously that would be the party's ability and willingness to comply with an adverse award on costs. We've seen that as a standard feature of the jurisprudence, but something that we have also added in, again, reflecting the need for balance, is the impact of getting security for costs on a party's ability to pursue its case. And I think we often don't realize that sometimes it can be difficult and expensive to put security for costs into a case. And so having the tribunal able to uh, take that into consideration is an important part of a balanced security for costs rule. We also require the tribunal to think about the conduct of the parties. And so I don't know exactly how that will be implemented in practice, but among the thoughts we had when we put that forward was that if you had parties who were asking for security for costs and yet were refusing, for example, to pay their advance, that would be sort of odd incongruous conduct and maybe a reason mitigating against a security for costs award. So that's the kind of thing we were thinking of in that term. Um, one of the more difficult discussions or long discussions we had here was whether the fact of third party funding should result in an automatic order for security for costs. And as you know, that is not what happens in practice. And what we have proposed is that the mere fact of third party funding would not result in security. Obviously, we would expect parties may want to bring up the fact of third party funding, but we well know that the mere fact of third party funding does not mean an impecunious claimant or a claimant who's not willing to pay an adverse award. So one does not necessarily lead to the other. In terms of transparency, we have moved the ball forward in terms of much more automatic publication of awards and uh, a, large, uh, a better system in terms of ability to redact awards and decisions so that parties can get those out into the public domain. We have added a rule for participation of non-disputing treaty parties, in other words, the other party to the bit. And we've also added a rule that reflects uh, the categories of confidential or protected information that would not be subject to disclosure. And I think that was important to states as you are moving towards more and more and more automatic disclosure, that you also have a more clear idea of the kinds of information that would not be disclosed and that would be redacted. Um, in terms of new options for dispute settlement, I think the big news there, of course, is the mediation rules. And this complements a lot of treaties that are starting to either require or encourage mediation of cases. And we have made these so that they are very much available to any parties in a dispute relating to investment. They are not tied to being a member of the ICSID convention. So the idea here was to make them broadly available to states, investors, and REIOs. And we have already had a couple of parties come to us and start mediations based on the text of the mediation rules. And we have done also a lot of early uh, training and technical assistance on this. So I am hoping that this will be successful and that parties will be using and putting this into place. And obviously it's very much complemented 
by the Singapore Convention. We made sure that the mediation rules would fit with the Singapore Convention on enforcement so it all comes together. We have a revised fact-finding set of rules and I will be honest, we actually debated getting rid of fact-finding. We've had it in the ICSID rules since about 78, but never had a case. But we felt that the idea here was to make the tools available. So we simplified them and made them more broadly available. It will obviously be the very specific circumstance where they are useful, but they are there for that circumstance. And then finally, of course, we're continuing to offer administration of UNCITRAL and ad hoc cases. Um, so that's a little bit about our rules reform process. Just one or two words on the draft code of conduct. As you know, the draft code uh, has been developed jointly by the ICSID and UNCITRAL secretariats. Uh, the first version was published in May of 2020, the second in April of 2021, and we just concluded a consultation last week on this code. The idea was that you would have available a generally applicable code of conduct for investor state cases, and that it would address some of the issues which are specific or specifically complicated in the investor state context. The whole question, for example, of double hatting or repeat appointment or enforcement. And so that is out and available publicly. Uh, and in terms of that, there has been really, again, a, um, the effort has been very broad disclosure. So not just disclosure of things you th think might create a conflict, but disclosure of a lot of information for the sake of transparency and for the sake of confidence about whether there is a concern about independence and impartiality. So things like, does the arbitrator have contacts with other parties, with counsel, those kinds of issues. Uh, a full disclosure of past cases so that parties can inform themselves about whether they think there is a conflict. On repeat appointment, there is no prohibition per se, uh, but if it rises obviously to the level of an absence of independence, then of course repeat appointment would be problematic. The discussion that has probably been the most involved has been the whole question of a prohibition on double hatting. And uh, a number of states, I think, are uh, in favor of a full prohibition of double hatting. But there is also very much an awareness of the potential impact of a prohibition on double hatting on getting uh, diverse and new arbitrators into the arbitral pool, uh, making sure you have a pool of expert arbitrators, and just the notion of freedom of appointment, which is one of those key issues or key uh, guarantees of the arbitral process. So that's where uh, that lasts. We are hoping a third version incorporating the comments that we are getting now will be out towards the uh, early fall. So you have a lot happening on the reform agenda and I will pass it back to my colleagues for them to add their perspectives on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kinnear, for that wonderful uh, overview. I'll certainly in the question period uh, ask you a bit more about how Asian countries in particular were involved in uh, these issues. But now let's pass on to UNCTAD. Uh, we're privileged to have an equally uh, distinguished person to discuss that forum. That's Hamid El Kadi. Uh, he's in charge of the International Investment Agreements or IIA's work stream within UNCTAD. He's part of a core team, uh, core team drafting the World Investment Report. He's authored a number of UNCTAD's series on international investment policies for development, he provides technical advice to government officials and policymakers on issues related to investment policies for sustainable development. And that includes advisory services on the uh, revising of bilateral investment treaties or BITS and investment chapters in regional free trade agreements. He's coordinated the implementation of over 40 international, regional and national conferences, seminars, workshops, on investment issues worldwide. He's a member of UNCTAD's core team for the World Investment Forum, and he too has published a number of articles in international trade and investment policies, 
and on development implications. Uh, with that, let us, let's turn it over to Mr. Alcadity. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Alvarez, for the uh, introduction. Uh, allow me first to thank CIL and the US Asia Law Institute uh, for this um, timely uh, conference. It's really a great pleasure to be with you and to share with you uh, some of the work uh, we are doing in UNCTAD um, in terms of uh, the reform of the international uh, investment regime. Um, as some of you know, UNCTAD has been calling uh, for the reform of the uh, investment regime uh, for over a decade. Um, as an overarching um, document, we have our uh, investment policy framework for sustainable development, um, which includes really um, the main objectives that we are trying to achieve in terms of reforming um, IIAs. In a nutshell, uh, we assist countries in moving um, to a new generation of international investment uh, policies by looking at their um, old generation uh, bilateral investment treaties or investment chapters in their FTAs and giving policy recommendations um, as well as the uh, the guiding the documents, the tools uh, to help them to reform these treaties, uh, basically with the objective of ensuring that um, um, countries have the right to regulate, uh, while of course maintaining effective uh, investment protection, and also equally important that these treaties reflect the era that we live in uh, today, namely the emergence of uh, global crisis, the importance of sustainable development. Um, in doing that, we also um, assist countries in refining certain terms and provisions uh, in the old generation uh, investment treaties that are uh, drafted in, in a very broad manner uh, and that could uh, create unintended consequences uh, for the parties. Um, so our uh, investment policy framework for sustainable development uh, it includes three aspects. The first aspect is that it includes 10 uh, guiding principles for investment policy making. And we were successful in working with regional uh, organizations as well as countries uh, in, uh, for the adoption of some of these guiding principles, of course, they adapt them to their own needs. Uh, our guiding principles are mostly used as, as an inspiration uh, to um, what these principles should be. They are available in the policy framework. Uh, the framework also includes um, guidance for uh, national investment policy making, so national investment laws and regulations, as well as the topic of uh, today's uh, presentation uh, and session uh, international investment agreements. Um, we look at the reform of investment agreements in a comprehensive manner. Um, we look at the uh, substantive issues, we look at the procedural issues, and now we're also uh, closely following other um, developments in the WTO and in the investment facilitation, of course, and also investment policy making at the regional level whether it is in Africa with the investment, uh, ongoing negotiations and discussions of the investment protocol for the African continental FTA, for example. Um, there are five main action uh, areas that UNCTAD has identified, and these are uh, safeguarding the right to regulate uh, while maintaining um, uh, protection, reforming um, investment dispute settlement mechanism, uh, promoting and facilitating investment uh, for sustainable development, ensuring uh, responsible investment. Uh, there are many different terms for that. It, some call it corporate social responsibility or investors behavior, but basically ensuring that investors are operating in accordance with host states laws and regulations and that they conduct their uh, operations in, an, in a responsible manner. And finally, enhancing consistency among all aspects of investment policy making, starting from your national laws, your bilateral investment treaties, 
your investment chapters in your FTAs, if you're a member of a regional integration group that has an investment agreement. And so uh, assisting countries making sense of this puzzle and putting the right um, uh, play puzzles together so that in the end, countries have um, a coherent investment treaty network. Of course, cohere no treaty network can be fully coherent, um, but at least that there is a degree of consistency and that um, the international investment policy of these countries uh, are aimed at achieving certain developmental uh, objectives as well. So we approach this in different phases. Um, uh, the first phase is we assist countries in the development of a model uh, that they can use in the negotiations of new um, I, uh, international investment treaties or bilateral investment treaties, if you prefer. Um, and also um, uh, looking at how to um, uh, include certain provisions in your new IIAs that uh, respond or that reflect these five action objectives that, uh, that I just uh, mentioned. Um, once countries have, been, um, have worked on the phase one, which means have started concluding new treaties that have sustainable development objectives and ensuring the right to regulate that they have a model, it is extremely important to then look at what we call the second phase of the reform, which is to tackle your existing or a country's existing network of BITs. So we often see countries concluding uh, new generation treaties uh, that reflect all the objectives I mentioned that have developed a model, that are engaged in new generation negotiations at the regional level, uh, but that they maintain uh, uh, their old uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, concluded in the 70s or 80s or 90s. And uh, reforming these treaties is sometimes uh, uh, very slow. Um, so this is what we call the second phase of IIA reform. Um, in terms of um, progress, we see a lot of progress uh, in the past a few years at, at the global level, not, not in one particular region, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, with regards to phase one of investment treaty reform. There is a lot of awareness, uh, much more than 10 or 20 years ago, about the implication of these treaties. There is more awareness about the importance of these treaties, uh, more awareness about um, the importance of negotiating treaties that reflect your national development strategies, as well as maintaining investment protection. Uh, so in the past, you would have very often a bilateral investment treaty concluded in a matter of hours. Uh, this is no longer the case now. You hear about rounds of negotiations for a BIT or even longer for an FTA, of course, rounds and rounds of negotiations. That shows the seriousness uh, that the negotiators and policymakers um, um, are giving to these treaties. So this is an achievement that, um, that the implications of these treaties are, are more uh, known now to the um, uh, to countries. Um, in terms of, of tackling the second phase of IIA reform, also the importance of this is that we see that um, over 90% of the investment treaty regime, which is constituted of over 3,000 uh, bilateral investment treaties, 90% of them were concluded uh, before 2010, so a decade ago. Um, and if we push the statistics, we can see that maybe 80% have been concluded of, basically the 90s was the period where bilateral investment treaties have been proliferating extremely rapidly. Um, I think I remember on average, there was between 150 to 200 bilateral investment treaties per year. And to the, in the last, uh, Two, three years that this number has fell to approximately 50, around 50 bilateral investment treaties annually. Um, also, these, uh, um, if I can call them old generation bilateral investment treaties, 
have been uh, the basis for um, most of the ISDS um, uh, dispute. Uh, so out of 1,091 known treaty-based, only treaty-based ISDS cases, uh, most of them have been filled uh, uh, on the basis of treaties concluded before 2010, which is a little bit normal, of course, but, but still gives an indication uh, that broadly drafted agreements uh, are maybe easier to, um, uh, to give access to ISDS than a treaty that is more refined, more balanced. And in, the key word is really balance. Uh, what we are trying to achieve is balance between uh, the interests of investors, uh, investment protection, but on the other hand, the interest of states which want to attract investment uh, but also want to ensure uh, a positive contribution of investments uh, in their, for their uh, national economies. Um, so we give 10 uh, concrete policy options on how to uh, reform your existing uh, investment uh, agreements, either by um, issuing joint interpretations, amending treaty provisions, I'm sorry, I'm reading because there's 10 of them, <laughs> replacing outdated treaties, consolidating the IIA network. And by consolidation, we mean that um, we often see um, a new free trade agreement among 10 parties, for example. Often these 10 parties uh, will have an investment chapter, a new generation investment chapter in that new regional FTAs. And FTA. And so what they often do is they have an annex that says that once this new generation FTA enters into force, then the BITs among the parties will cease to exist. And that is what we call a consolidation. Instead of having 10 or 20 bilateral investment treaties from the 1980s, you will have one modern regional uh, investment agreement. Um, managing relationships between coexisting treaties, which is um, basically uh, navigating the puzzle and ensuring that there are no obvious contradictions uh, between treaties, but also with your national investment laws and regulations. And also increasingly impo important today with other aspects, other areas like human rights, um, the environment, issues that are becoming increasingly important and increasingly interconnected with uh, investment law. I will, um, um, I will then just briefly highlight uh, the impact of our uh, technical assistance and uh, capacity building uh, work. Uh, we have developed or worked with um, over 130 countries uh, and regional economic integration groupings in developing uh, non-binding guiding principles for investment policy making. And these have uh, uh, the benefit of giving a positive signal to the business community um, that uh, the region or the country is open for investment. Um, it, it also has the benefit of giving in a concise manner. So high level, typically high level policy makers will read these 10, action, these 10 guiding principles for investment policy making. We have helped uh, develop jointly with the um, African, Caribbean and Pacific group of states, which includes, if I remember correctly, 79 countries, uh, joint guiding principles. We also worked very closely with the organization of the D8 uh, to adopt uh, guiding principles for investment uh, policy making as well as facilitating uh, work for the G20 on their guiding principles uh, for investment policy making. And finally, to conclude, just a few words on our uh, latest uh, policy tool or document uh, to assist countries in reforming their IIA regime. We released the IIA Reform Accelerator which basically gives the treaty negotiators or the policymaker the missing link. So they had all the theoretical guidance or the nice policy options, but there was always a gap between how do you translate these policy options into uh, treaty language. Uh, so the IIA Reform Accelerator includes a compilation uh, 
of existing um, um, treaty language in modern investment treaties with explanatory notes so that government officials and negotiators can uh, form a, an IIA in a, in a faster manner uh, in order to either conclude new ones or um, I think even more importantly, renegotiate uh, uh, the old ones. Um, I will not take too long and I, I will uh, stick to the time so that maybe in the end we have time for, uh, for questions and answers, but just to reiterate UNCTAD's readiness to continue its technical assistance, capacity building uh, to all countries um, to um, assist them in moving from an old generation investment treaty network to a modern one that reflects not only one aspect, which is investor protection, but that respect that reflects a win-win situation and the interests of all parties involved. Thank you very much, Professor. I give back the floor to you. Thank you uh, very much for that excellent uh, overview. And uh, rather than take up uh, too much time, I want to turn to our third panelist, uh, Jansen Kalamita, uh, another uh, superb expert. Uh, he is a principal research fellow at the Center for International Law, research associate at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore. And he's uh, the head of that center's program on investment law and policy. He served in the office uh, previously of the legal advisor in the U.S. Department of State, representing the U.S. in international claims and investment disputes, including before the U.S. Iran Claims Tribunal. And before that, he served in the U.N. Office of Legal Affairs in Uncentral Secretariat. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Calameda. Thank you, uh, Professor Alvarez. Uh, my presentation will provide an overview of the UNCITRAL reform effort, um, dealing with the scope of the discussions, how the process is developing, and where I think we are going with this process. Um, just to note, tomorrow and Wednesday, we'll, have, we'll hear directly from states. Um, we'll be hearing from India, Korea, uh, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, so there'll be lots of opportunity to talk about the UNCITRAL process. Um, if you'll bear with me, let me just get my slides started. Okay. Um, so just to, to start, um, the reform agenda in UNSCRAL Working Group 3 um, has three parts. Uh, the first was to identify and consider uh, concerns regarding ISDS. The second was to determine whether or not states thought reform was desirable in light of those concerns. And the third was where we are now um, to develop uh, solutions or reforms um, in light of the identified concerns. Um, so we are well into the process already um, of the, the UNSTRAL Working Group 3. Um, and yet there is uh, substantial ways to go, I think, before we start to see uh, tangible fruit from, from most of the areas of concern. Um, I think it's worth highlighting the areas of concern that states uh, identified in uh, phases one and two of the UNCITRAL process, uh, because it helps us understand where we are in terms of potential reforms that are being discussed and being developed. Uh, many of them are reform or concerns rather that uh, have been driving uh, the ICSID reform process. Although of course, in the context of UNCITRAL, uh, the reforms under consideration are not limited to any particular type of arbitration, uh, but addressing ISDS uh, much more broadly. Um, the first concerned outcomes of decisions, and these are concerns about the consistency of decisions whether similar decision, similar cases involving similar or the same treaty are being decided in a consistent manner. The general coherent development of the international investment law regime, the predictability of understanding the ways in which tribunals will apply and interpret treaties, and moreover, a general concern about the correctness of decisions um, and the absence of 
appellate review or review on the substance or the merits of arbitral awards. Uh, the second broad head of concerns um, are with respect to the arbitrators. Um, concerns about uh, qualities, the qualifications of arbitrators, the absence of mandatory or effective rules with respect to qualifications, um, especially the independence and impartiality of arbitrations, uh, arbitrators, concerns about the party appointment mechanism itself, uh, repeat appointments, the role of law firms in repeat appointments, and the issue of double hatting, which uh, Secretary General Kinnear mentioned earlier, um, namely um, the practice of an individual serving as both an arbitrator and counsel in concurrent cases, and perhaps even as an expert witness uh, in another case as well. Um, and then lastly, the concerns about the diversity and representativeness of the arbitral bar, again, something that uh, Meg mentioned. Um, and in the context of Asia, this has a particular resonance. Um, just looking at uh, statistics drawn from, from ICSID's caseload, which are the most comprehensive public statistics that we have. And we can see that largely um, individuals from ASEAN, particularly Asia more generally, um, are not participating as arbitrators um, in ICSID cases and here, but more broadly, um, to any great degree. Um, less than 9% of uh, ICSID cases involving arbitrators from uh, Asian states. Um, and this, of course, is largely the, the decision of the participants in the process themselves, um, given that the, uh, the institution uh, has relatively few opportunities to appoint uh, arbitrators uh, in those cases. Um, the third head that we can talk about in terms of concerns um, with respect to cost and duration, and again, this has come up in the context of the ICSID uh, rule debates as well. Um, the size of awards, awards over a billion US dollars are no longer uncommon. Um, the costs of arbitration, uh, averaging a million dollars on costs and five million on legal fees on the state side, and questions about the ability of states to recover in the event that they're successful in defending themselves. Um, the impact of third-party funding, um, generally speaking, available only to uh, investors and claimants and, and not to um, states simply as a matter of the market mechanics of that institution. And finally, the duration of cases, which approximate four years in the first instance, adding another year or two uh, in the event that post-award remedies are sought. Uh, and then lastly, a perception of procedural imbalance uh, with respect to the regime. And this is states feeling that they had lost control with respect to who has access to ISDS, um, how their treaties are being interpreted and applied, and concerns that they increasingly do not have the capacity to defend ISDS claims uh, in the manner in which they would like. And that, of course, is really uh, particularly uh, a concern of developing states. Now, given the breadth of concerns that were identified in um, the first two phases of the UNCTRAL Working Group 3 debates, um, it raises a broad continuum of possible reforms from non-structural reforms to structural to paradigm shifting. And what this slide tries to do is to, to illustrate how that might flow from incremental improvements to the existing system of ad hoc investor state arbitration, the one that we have, to more structural improvements to the existing system again, such as adding an appellate mechanism on top of existing ad hoc investor state arbitration, through the much more structural revision of the system, leaving the institution of investor initiated dispute settlement, but replacing arbitration with a judicial structure and investment court um, all the way to the idea of just getting rid of investor state dispute settlement altogether, replacing it with a different kind of paradigm, um, one of investment facilitation and ultimately only state state uh, formal dispute settlement. Now, all of those have been raised in the context of the discussions um, that have taken place in working group three. Um, 
it's fair to say, however, that the lines have really been drawn on the non-structural versus structural side. Um, the paradigm shifting uh, approach from Brazil, um, the Brazilian delegation has presented it on a number of occasions, but is certainly not making a case for it to be adopted by the working group. And there doesn't seem to be much in in inclination from members of the working group to go in that direction. Rather, what we see are states which are interested in reforming the process as it currently stands, improving it, refining it, United States, Japan, the Russian Federation, and structural reformers who again seem to fall roughly within two camps, states which are willing to consider if not support an appellate mechanism uh, on top of the existing structure like China, India, Argentina, um, and states or organizations for which the only real solution to the reform uh, question is a multilateral investment court. Um, and that's, of course, the European Union, which has spearheaded that, um, and to a somewhat slightly lesser degree, Canada, uh, which has joined with the European Union um, in proposing that. Um, if we look at the current working group three work plan, um, it reflects what uh, I think, uh, it reflects those divisions in a sense. Um, the work plan that's been released by, uh, by the Secretariat um, identifies eight heads of work to go forward. Um, and as we can see, a number of those heads are cross-cutting, uh, which is to say that the issues and the so solutions that are being addressed um, under those heads um, could be applicable in the event of non-structural incremental reform, but they could also be applicable in the event of more systemic reform, like an appellate mechanism or a court. Um, I won't go through this, each of these uh, headings, um, but we can see, for example, under ADR mechanisms and dispute prevention. Here we're talking about things like mediation, like mechanisms for dealing with frivolous claims and early dismissal, mechanisms for consolidation, dealing with shareholder claims for reflective loss, counterclaims, and so forth, all of which in principle could be subsumed or, or useful um, in a discussion about an incremental reform of the existing system or the creation of a new institutional structure like a permanent investment court. Um, similarly, with respect to the code of conduct and with respect to the issues captured under the much broader heading of ISDS, procedural rules, reforms, um, other cross-cutting issues, like including damages, for example. Again, these could be applicable whether one is looking at uh, incremental reform or more structural reform, like adopting a court. Others are more specific to the particular uh, main modality of reform. So selection and appointment of arbitrators, obviously, that assumes that there will be arbitrators. And so it focuses on the incremental reform track. The appellate mechanism, the multilateral investment court, obviously those speak for themselves, dealing with those particular reform options. Most interesting perhaps in all of this is the multilateral advisory center. The idea being put forward uh, principally by the European Union that a multilateral advisory center would be established, which would serve to assist states, principally developing states, uh, with respect to investment treaties. The scope of that is not quite clear, whether it would have to do with negotiation, with implementation, or with uh, claims defense. Um, but what is clear from the European Union side is that it goes hand in hand with the investment court. The EU does not seem prepared to um, support a multilateral advisory center without the creation of a multilateral investment court. And in that respect, it is somehow a, a quid pro quo or a, a, a carrot for, uh, for developing states to perhaps support the EU's broader reform efforts. Um, looking at the working group plan, um, we see it stretches out until 2026. And fully 137 days of meetings and discussions are currently um, proposed during that period. Um, different streams will proceed at different paces. Um, and what's noteworthy, I suppose, about all of this is the large number of days that are dedicated to addressing these issues. Um, the fact that it calls for um, an additional four-day working group session each year. Um, there had originally been discussion about having two additional sessions of the working group each year. 
Um, but what it speaks to as well is the, the speed uh, and the complexity of the process as we are now moving into this third stage. So already there are draft secretariat papers out for comment in some cases, second rounds of comments, um, dealing with a variety of issues, advisory center, third party funding, the code of conduct that Meg was talking about. Um, and there are many more in the pipeline, which I will not read for us here, but cover the full range of issues that, um, that I've described and, and that fall under the eight work streams. Um, observations on the process and where we are now and where this may be going. I mean, as I said, the process is becoming increasingly complex. Um, there are eight work streams to consider. There are three main tracks of reform possible, incremental, appellate mechanism, an investment court. Um, and of course, the reform discussions are not only occurring in UNCITRAL, but in ICSID, in the WTO, and so forth. And what that means is it's a major capacity challenge for developing states to stay on top of developments, to participate in developments, and to make themselves heard. Um, it's also a major capacity challenge uh, within UNCITRAL. Um, the resources of the Secretariat are, are being taxed um, in preparing these working papers um, for, the, uh, for consideration by the working group, and as are translation services. And indeed, in many of these intercessional and other meetings that are being um, planned uh, to take place, um, there is likely not to be uh, translation, um, certainly not into the full range of UN languages, um, but perhaps uh, not at all, uh, depending upon the availability of resources. Um, in terms of Asian participation, something we can talk about further, um, and the question of Asian, Asian leadership, indeed, um, we've seen significant interventions uh, consistently throughout the process by especially the developed states, Japan, Korea, and Singapore, um, much less from China, and, and certainly, at least from where I sit, um, a reluctance perhaps by China to assume a leadership role in advancing a particular agenda um, in the IST reform debates here. Um, in terms of ASEAN particularly, there's been participation by Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, um, it's not particularly a coordinated uh, participation, but certainly those states within ASEAN are making them, their voices heard. Um, other member states of ASEAN, however, um, we've heard from far, far less often. So that's a broad and brief overview of the UNCITRAL Working Group 3 reform process. With that, let me hand things back to uh, Jose. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Professor Calamita, for that fantastic uh, overview in a very brief time. I know how press it is to discuss uh, Own Central's Working Group 3 mission creep, which is certainly what I would call it. But also thank you for teeing up uh, the overarching question that we'll be addressing much more uh, in the rest of our conference, that is the role of Asian states, Asian leaders, the role of ASEAN, but also I think you teed up the possibility, which we hope can discuss, of the possibility that at least in working group three and perhaps elsewhere, there may be reform fatigue setting in at some time. Uh, this is an awful lot of diplomatic work for this. So let's proceed quickly uh, to Professor Manjou uh, Chi, or otherwise known as Cliff, uh, to many of us. He's currently professor, founding director of the Center for International Economic Law and Policy in the Law School at the University of International Business and Economics in China. His research focuses on international trade, investment law and policy, dispute settlement, global development and cooperation law. He's the author of numerous books and journals in both English and Chinese. He's the founding editor of the Asian Yearbook of International Economic Law and serves on a number of steering committees related to this topic. And he's uh, been a visiting professor at leading law schools throughout North America, uh, Europe, and Asia. And with that, uh, I turn it over for uh, your uh, overview, uh, Cliff. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Alvarez. Um, let me just uh, uh, 
share my screen. Uh, I'm not sure if this is, uh, so Jerry, can you tell me this is, um, this is done? Yes, this is working. Okay, great, great. Because I, I can't see uh, myself, my image. So uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the kind words of introduction. And of course, let me start by thanking uh, NYU and uh, CLF and uh, NUS for uh, giving me this opportunity to join this distinguished panel uh, discussing very uh, cutting edge and interesting issues with regard to uh, investment law uh, reform. Uh, as said, I, I will focus on uh, the issue of uh, WTO um, and the investment law uh, reform or development in uh, the WTO. So um, somehow different from uh, the uh, ICSID, UNCTAD and UNCITRA Working Group 3, uh, WTU is not really famous for uh, investment law making. Uh, actually, since the establishment of the WTU in 1995, uh, WTU has tried, member states, tried in uh, Singapore issues of 1996. Um, uh, there are four uh, different issues, and one of these issues is an investment uh, treaty or investment agreement within the WTO, but um, these uh, efforts failed, and uh, the issue of the investment treaty was dropped in 2003 and therefore currently in the WTO uh, legal system there is no standalone rule with regard to uh, investment law. Uh, but that said, it doesn't mean WTO is completely isolated from investment rules. Uh, as we will discuss a little bit later, uh, there are a number of WTO rules uh, that uh, are connected with investment, particularly uh, the, uh, the agreement uh, in trading uh, in service gaps. So uh, why do we need, or in, in other words, why the WTO need a, a treaty on investment facilitation or an agreement? Um, according to the WTO members, um, today's integrated global economy expanding investment flows wrongly depend on simplifying and speeding up and coordinating administrative procedures. Uh, which calls for investment facilitation uh, measures or investment facilitation reforms. The bottlenecks, in inefficiencies and uncertainties that investment facilitation seeks to address arise from unnecessary red tape, bureaucratic overlap or out-of-date procedures which can, be, which can become costly impediments to investment. It is particularly the case of least developed countries and developing countries and there are already discussions that uh, for many uh, developing, uh, developed countries, uh, they have already at very high uh, standard of uh, investment facilitation in their uh, governance or bureaucratic uh, procedures. But for developing and least developed countries, and these uh, procedures are not really very friendly. So there is a need for reform and there is a need for a promotion of investment facilitation in the WTO. And this is also one of the major reasons to explain why different, different from other WTO agreements in the past, uh, this uh, agreement, investment for facilitation agreement, is actually uh, 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 proposed and, and to a certain extent promoted by developing countries in the WTO. So uh, next, what will be included or what will be discussed in this agreement? Uh, there are several contentious investment issues were excluded from the outset of investment facilitation and therefore, we would expect that this agreement, investment facilitation a framework for uh, development, will not cover certain issues that are very contentious nowadays. And these issues are market access issues, investment protection issues, and investor state dispute settlement issues, or ISDS, or arbitration issues. And therefore, these contentious issues that are actually pertaining to what we have discussed, especially with regard to uh, ISDS reform, uh, are most likely not be included in the investment facilitation framework. Uh, but again, as we will discuss, this doesn't mean this framework, framework will be completely immune from, let's say, investment uh, protection or in market access or investment arbitration. Um, on the contrary, uh, investment facilitation framework negotiations aims at improved transparency 
predictability, efficiency, and consistency of national investment regulatory regimes. And this implies that these framework would be a major deviation from almost all existing investment treaties, BITs. As we all know, uh, the existing treaties, investment treaties focus more on investment protection and investment arbitration. So um, very briefly, let me go to the uh, WTO investment facilitation framework negotiation or discussion process. Uh, the discussion is still ongoing. Um, uh, I actually uh, just tried to quote a few uh, milestone uh, time points to illustrate uh, how this process is going. On December the 13th, 2017, um, that's during the, uh, the MS-11, that's the 11th Ministerial Conference, um, uh, three proponent groups announced new initiative to advance talks at the WTO on the issues of electronic commerce, investment facilitation, and micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. At that moment, over 70 uh, WTO members joined the initiative. And therefore that was deemed to a certain extent as an official start of the, of the discussion of uh, investment facilitation within the WTO. Um, with the time being uh, on 2020 and uh, November 2019, 98 members expressed support for the uh, 2017 joint ministerial statement. And uh, we see more countries, WTO members, are committed to intensifying work to further develop the framework uh, for facilitating FDI, foreign di direct investment, and to work uh, towards a concrete outcome on investment facilitation for development at MC12, which is um, supposed to be um, this year. Um, last year is a milestone um, for the development of uh, investment facilitation framework within the WTO. On September the 25th, participants in the structured discussions of the investment facilitation framework began formal negotiations on this framework. Uh, the negotiations attracted over 100, um, currently um, standing at 106 members uh, in the negotiation. Um, in the future, it is possible that more uh, WTO members will join, but um, it is unlikely, at least at the, the current point of uh, time, that all members will join in a short uh, period. So these were three uh, critical, uh, I would say, critical uh, time points. Uh, there are many members during this period of time have submitted proposals and several rounds of negotiations on the framework have already been held up to today. Um, according to the WTO, uh, good progress have been made especially uh, participating members have discussed various provisions on the Easter consolidated text uh, delivered in this April. Um, but uh, due to the, um, the transparency, um, uh, the uh, consolidated text is still under negotiation. So currently uh, I'm afraid we cannot have the, uh, the version of these uh, texts um, publicly available on the WTO website. So um, that, is the basic um, uh, timeline of the negotiation or discussion of the investment facilitation within the WTO. So uh, in the next like 10 minutes, let me just try to focus on some outstanding issues and what we should um, really uh, look into in this um, WTO negotiation with investment facilitation. And I categorize them into three different words. One is identification. So basically that means uh, identification of investment facilitation obligations or measures. What are obligations that could be deemed at inve as investment facilitation, but not, let's say, other kind of uh, uh, obligations, or uh, are there any overlap of these obligations? And the second is um, uh, internal or at the WTO level. So that is an issue of integration. There are different aspects of the integration. And first is how these uh, investment facilitation framework, if that is, let's say, a treaty or an agreement uh, under the WTO cover, how that agreement will be made a WTO agreement. And the second, of course, is from the rule uh, perspective, uh, how investment ob uh, facilitation obligations will be incorporated uh, 
into existing WTO rules, um, <clears throat> particularly uh, into the GATS. So that's basically the issue of compatibility. Um, and a third uh, issue is uh, what I call um, the issue of insulation, um, because investment facilitation is uh, not a new obligation. I would say a, a number of investment facilitation measures have already uh, taken shape in existing investment treaties, not necessarily in the title of investment facilitation. Uh, we see a number of uh, uh, provisions are actually investment facilitation provisions as well. For example, transparency provisions in many investment treaties are also deemed as a kind of investment facilitation, a measure or obligation. So there is a need to insulate uh, the uh, WTO investment facilitation obligations from uh, the existing investment treaty uh, regime, particularly uh, investment arbitration. So very briefly, uh, let me uh, go into these um, um, three different uh, aspects. Um, with regard to identification, uh, there seems no fixed and globally unanimous definition of investment facilitation. Uh, this is the first challenge um, uh, that the, the WTO members are uh, confronting. Uh, they have to identify investment rules that could and should be incorporated in the framework. Uh, this not only uh, is a, an issue of consensus building among interest WTO members for the purpose of negotiation, but also a conceptualization process of clarifying investment facilitation. Um, <clears throat> because as I've already mentioned, investment facilitation is widely deemed as a very, very flexible and very broad term. Um, and then um, it is largely agreed that certain rules that can be used for improving transparency, predictability, efficiency, and consistency of national investment regulatory regimes can be deemed as investment facilitation rules. And therefore, in this sense, we could see, first of all, uh, the investment rules would be very broadly defined. Um, and then the second of all, in a sense, the investment rules, facilitation rules are uh, a result or effect based. So basically, if a rule that can be uh, used for the purpose and have an effect of improving transparency, predictability, if efficiency, and consistency of investment regulatory regimes, that kind of um, rules can be deemed as an investment facilitation rule. <clears throat> so, um, uh, uh, a large portion of discussion and negotiation documents so far uh, that I, I've already mentioned in uh, the WTO negotiations uh, so far, are, which are still classified on the uh, website. Um, but um, if we have a look at these um, uh, revealed um, uh, documents, we could uh, summarize that uh, there are some certain consensus already made. Uh, there are major investment facilitation rules um, uh, these rules would cover transparency, simplified and streamlined administrative procedure, focal points, uh, international cooperation, uh, corporate social responsibility, anti-corruption, small and medium enterprise, uh, special and differential treatment for developing countries and least developed countries, and capacity building. And all these rules would, uh, are deemed widely as investment facilitation rules that uh, we probably will find in the future uh, text of the uh, framework agreement. So the next issue is integration within the WTO level. Um, the joint ministerial statement has envisaged that this framework should be a multilateral framework. And this impliedly uh, rules out the plurilateral treaty such as WTO uh, GPA, that's the government procurement agreement, which is kind of closed agreement that only bind uh, the interested and joining uh, signatory uh, members. Uh, the framework as a multilateral agreement would need to be endorsed by all WTO members. So from the treaty perspective, um, the WTO uh, trade facilitation agreement has been an example for many um, uh, practitioners, scholars and members in discussing the framework uh, of investment facilitation. So the investment facilitation framework may bind only a critical mass of signatories that are ready to accept the policy constraints involved and willing to extend the agreement's benefit to all members, including those not assuming reciprocal obligations. 
So this is the uh, uh, ideal uh, way of uh, so far has been envisaged by the the uh, uh, negotiation of investment facilitation framework that would be an open plurilateral agreement, and um, there would be a critical mass uh, or critical situation uh, condition. Once the condition is uh, reached, then uh, the agreement will become um, uh, binding. Um, but then uh, these agreements would raise uh, at least two uh, systematic issues. The first is compatibility issue. That's particularly an issue with the GATS. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, the GATS, especially the mode three, that's the commercial uh, presence um, as a form of uh, service trade, actually um, is dealing with investment, foreign direct investment that actually counts for 60% of trading service nowadays. So it's very, very important. And GATS rules already actually governs the, um, the uh, trading service and the most sweet. So when investment facilitation uh, framework obligations are negotiating and made, um, the, the challenge is how to reconcile or how to make uh, the GATS provisions and the framework investment facilitation rules consistent and harmonized with each other. Uh, here, there are certain examples. For example, um, uh, GATS includes transparency, consistency, and predictability of relevant provision, uh, measures, and these kind of uh, uh, provisions in the GATS. So will the framework incorporate the same uh, obligations? And if the same obligations are incorporated in the framework, are the, the obligations, the exact obligations on the members uh, be interpreted and applied in the same way. So will that there, there need to be um, a harmonization? So I believe this would be um, uh, a challenge to uh, WTO members. And a second challenge is incorporation of new investment obligations. Um, there are certain uh, obligations um, that are um, not in the uh, service obligations, so they are not covered by the GATS. Therefore, they are not subject to WTO disciplines. So in this kind of uh, obligations, um, the consensus decision is needed uh, to make sure that the obligations be incorporated into the WTO. Um, so that's the way of uh, making the WTO obligations. So uh, the third issue, which has been uh, very, very uh, heatedly discussed in recent a uh, few uh, years is the insulation issue. Um, um, investment facilitation, as I've mentioned, is very broadly um, defined and understood. And therefore, um, when the investment facilitation framework is uh, made within the WTO, um, it is uh, inevitable that this framework would have overlap with the existing investment treaties, BITs, for example. As I've mentioned, a number of investment facilitation Measures are also incorporated in existing BITs, such as transparency, such as uh, uh, international cooperation, such as capacity building, um, such as, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, anti-corruption uh, issues. And many of these uh, provisions are already uh, widely seen in existing uh, treaties, uh, BITs already. So here we have two layers of, um, uh, of the interactions between IIAs, uh, investment treaties, and the framework. First is the normative interface. Um, there are treaty bridging clauses in investment treaties, most favor nation clause and umbrella clauses, um, which are very familiar to, I, I guess, to everybody in the field of investment law. Um, so by most favor nation clause and umbrella clause, if broadly uh, um, def uh, designed, um, these clauses could be used uh, to uh, be a treaty region clause between uh, investment treaty and the investment uh, facilitation agreement in the WTO that would potentially uh, bring a, a breach or an obligation of the investment facilitation framework to the uh, BIT or investment arbitration system. So adjudicative interference uh, interface actually is a furtherance of the normative interface. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, MFN clause and umbrella clause have this treaty region uh, uh, function. But aside from that, and probably a more uh, difficult and more uh, delicate 
is um, the actual uh, interpretation and application of indirect expropriation and fair and equitable treatment that are widely existing in uh, BITs. Um, especially uh, as there is um, um, uh, often uh, criticized as uh, a flexible or expensive interpretation and application of these treaty uh, clauses. And these treaty clauses actually aim at uh, regulatory measures of host governments. Therefore, uh, there, there is a high risk uh, that uh, by applying and in interpreting these um, uh, clauses, uh, in expropriation and FET clauses, um, the uh, obligation or breach of an investment facilitation uh, could be interpreted into uh, the investment arbitration system. So these are uh, potential uh, difficulty issues that uh, need to be uh, discussed by the members and the members are uh, in the need to find a way uh, to design certain rules um, in the WTO um, uh, framework uh, to make sure that there is a kind of insulation. So uh, very final, uh, uh, there are potential reform impacts I just highlight this because I realize the time is, uh, is limiting and I, I will not discuss them in detail. Uh, the, the, the major issues would be impact of, um, of the framework to uh, the, the reform of international um, uh, investment law. Um, the, uh, the first issue is the existing IIA or investment law focus shift. Brazil has already shifted to uh, investment facilitation and cooperation, which is different from ex existing ones, and the dispute settlement. Um, today's session, uh, we, we uh, heard a lot of uh, dispute settlement, which is really important. Uh, IF obligations are deep in government con conducts, invest uh, indirect expropriation and FET issues will be a possible possibility for erosion uh, of state regulatory, not only with regard to uh, uh, investment law, but also uh, by, by the bridging uh, function would be, uh, would be that a kind of spill of, uh, spillover effect of uh, the investment facilitation framework. So consistency, will WTO framework be used as a, a level, um, uh, the playground? for future um, uh, negotiations, either um, on the, the bilateral way or in multilateral way uh, with regard to investment facilitation. So uh, I, I, I will not discuss too much. I think uh, we will have opportunity uh, to discuss that in the Q&A. So with that, I am stopping here and thank you again. Thank you, uh, Cliff, for that uh, very fast paced uh, overview of what the WTO uh, may be up to. Now, uh, there's over 100 participants. Now is your chance uh, to write out questions. One of the things that has emerged is uh, many of you want the PowerPoints. And I think at least two of our panelists have already agreed, so we'll get those out to you. Um, and perhaps, Cliff, uh, you can indicate yes. whether you want to uh, have your PowerPoints available. I think the, sure. the, the folks who are listening in uh, can be excused if they feel that they have been at the outer end of a hose of information, just chunks of information being shot out at you. Uh, and so I think the PowerPoints uh, will hopefully help to uh, uh, elucidate some of the points, especially to those who haven't been following uh, these uh, venues for reform. And keep in mind for those of you who are uh, intending on listening in to the rest of the conference, that much of what you've heard today is the basis of things that will be revisited in uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday's uh, events. Uh, I, I, I have got, I've got a sense that a lot of these things will come up uh, again. So one of the things that uh, uh, Professor Kalamita uh, teed up was the role of Asian uh, states and especially ASEAN, but also Asian leaders. And I wanna get back to those of you who didn't address this. So um, uh, that is, if you can say a few words about uh, what uh, has been, after all, the theme of this conference is Asian perspectives on reform. So Meg, if I can turn to you, can you say anything about uh, any distinctive roles Asian countries may have played in exit rule amendments? Um, uh, just, just to tee that up. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting to me is that we haven't seen any 
block negotiations from anywhere, Z in Asia, Africa, and we're often asked this question. But what I can say in terms of the Asian states is that they've been very, very involved. They've been very collaborative um, and in many ways have sort of helped try and breach the differences between different positions. So they've been very, very active participants, but I don't think you could say there's an ASEAN position per se. Thank you. The same up uh, for you, Hamid, and uh, Ang Ted. Can you say anything uh, a bit more specific about the Asian region or particular countries? Um, yes, thank you, Professor Alvarez. I think the uh, uh, answer is very similar to, uh, to Meg's answer, that we are seeing IIA reform um, at the global level. So there is no specific region, but of course there are extremely important uh, uh, silos of reform, uh, for example, in uh, India, uh, more recently Pakistan, Indonesia, mm -hmm. and the reform approaches are, are taking different uh, shapes. So some countries uh, have terminated altogether their bilateral investment treaties, developed a new model, and then started uh, renegotiating new treaties on the basis uh, of this uh, model. But if we look at the uh, reform in Asia, what, what we can really see is that at the regional level, what we call mega regional agreements. And there we can see, for example, in the RCEP, uh, very refined provisions, uh, clarifying definition of investors, of investment and investors. Uh, refining fair and equitable treatment, uh, national treatment, and we see similar uh, similar approach also in uh, in the ASEAN treaties, as well as in the CPTPP, which also includes uh, Asian uh, countries. So there are reforms at the national uh, at, at the national country level and also at the mega regional level. But what we can also see is that unfortunately countries engage full force in modernizing their investment treaties after uh, a very big ISDS case. Uh, a, a, a case that either involves a, a very big sum uh, sought by the investor or that uh, touches on uh, the regulatory uh, freedom, if you wish, of the country. And then all of the sudden, um, the awareness goes to the highest level of decision makers. Um, yeah, I will stop here. Thank you, Professor. Well, it would be interesting. I, I'm not sure that UNCTAD has followed this, but my suspicion has always been uh, that uh, reforms usually follow at least a threatened case or a big lo uh, loss, uh, especially for a country that's never faced uh, one of these disputes. And I'd be curious if there's a, a line you can draw between a country's enthusiasm for embracing some of your agenda for IIA reform, especially phase two, uh, that comes only after they've been phased, uh, they've been faced with an actual claim. Uh, so Cliff, uh, I guess I wanted to ask you the same thing, and I, I suspected you may have a similar answer, but can you say something more about the WTO and, and Asia perspectives within it on this facilitation <laughs> issue? Um, yes, yes, uh, Jose. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, uh, I, I actually dealt with this issue uh, from the Asian Pacific uh, perspective um, for a meeting by uh, um, ISCAP uh, a few, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, Asian Pacific countries, um, uh, I, I did research in their uh, BITs, FTAs. They are my, my general uh, uh, I, uh, observation is that these countries are getting uh, increasingly friendly towards investment facilitation in their treaty making. Um, uh, the observations are, uh, first of all, before 2008, uh, Asian countries' uh, BITs mainly include um, uh, four types of uh, investment facilitation provisions, namely in the preamble, that's declaratory, uh, visa facilitation, uh, transparency of law, and uh, international cooperation. So these are the four major ones. But we see uh, after 2008, um, uh, there are developments. Uh, the first development is that more types of investment facilitation rules are now incorporated into BITs and RTAs, especially uh, mega RTAs, um, such as anti-corruption, a small and medium-sized enterprise, corporate social responsibility obligations are entering uh, uh, investment treaties uh, and uh, uh, RTAs in these countries, uh, in these region. 
And the second observation is that we see uh, uh, still the, the huge disparity between uh, developed and least and developing economies uh, with regard to investment facilitation in this region. Um, treaties of developed countries like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, also including China, although I, I doubt if China is a developed economy, but let's say uh, in these uh, countries, um, the, um, uh, the uh, investment facilitation provisions are, are of more types and uh, uh, um, bigger in number. Uh, but in least developed and developing countries uh, like ASEAN countries and other um, uh, smaller countries um, uh, in this region, uh, uh, investment facilitation rules are not that much. So recent RTAs such as RCEP and uh, CPTPP have more uh, investment facilitation related provisions. So I think this is a very good sign. So very briefly, um, I believe investment facilitation is deemed by many WTO members or by uh, countries around the world um, that would be a, a streamlining uh, government regulation. So it would benefit all countries, particularly those developing countries who are in need of uh, uh, investment. Uh, so that should be, uh, uh, I, I would say that should be a, a prospect in the future countries who would be happy to work further in this regard. So back to you, Jose. So, so Cliff, just to follow up, you did mention China, and of course the EU-China Investment Treaty uh, does not uh, have ISDS. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course China, as Professor Calameda has indicated, at least in Working Group 3, has endorsed ISDS, at least reforming it along the lines of of the of ICSID's reforms. So can you say a bit more about what you see as China's uh, view of both trade facilitation and ISDS and how that may relate to each other? Uh, yes, uh, for, for, for China, I, I think it's, uh, uh, China is also uh, one of the major proponents of the investment facilitation in the WTO together with Brazil and a number of other uh, uh, BRIC countries uh, other, uh, there. Uh, but with regard to investment facilitation, the CAI between China and the EU does not include uh, investment uh, dispute settlement. Uh, but uh, the, the two parties have agreed uh, to uh, negotiate this uh, issue, investment arbitration or dispute settlement, broadly speaking, and investment uh, protection uh, issues in the next two years. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, um, the two sides would negotiate on that. But of course, um, um, uh, as we have seen that because of the, the tension between the two parties, um, the, uh, the EU side is already frozen. Uh, the process of ratifying this um, uh, treaty. So uh, we don't know yet, but uh, when that will be done. But with regard to um, uh, the UNCITRA Working Group 3, I believe China uh, submitted a, a position paper in 2019, in July. Uh, China's position is that China uh, would look for a kind of hybrid way uh, mechanism that combines arbitration, basically existing one, plus a, a permanent uh, uh, appellate body. So China relies, my, my sense is that China relies heavily on its experience of WTO uh, litigation. Uh, and China now over the years of 20 years, China has become very uh, accustomed and uh, not really afraid of WTO uh, dispute settlement. So, uh, I sense that China is, uh, is trying to make the future uh, investment uh, dispute settlement similar to the WTO one. Uh, that would probably be uh, the, the, the position of China, uh, so to say. Thank you so much. So we now have about 20 minutes left. So I encourage the participants, uh, over a hundred of you still are, are, are listening in to send in your questions. But I guess I want to use this opportunity where you're all here on the screen together uh, to start this discussion that I think both Cliff and Professor Kalamita introduced. And I'll start with Professor Kalamita, which is how do you see the interaction between uh, what you're dealing with in uh, Working Group 3 and all these other places? That is, is there a potential for a coherent set of reforms or do you see uh, these things at odds with each other? That is, working group three seems to be focusing as a, on a laser beam on uh, reforming how you handle disputes. UNCTAD looks like it's focusing almost equally strongly on reforming the substance 
not just the procedure of how you handle disputes. And uh, if I understand Cliff, it's sort of going around that altogether in the WTO. And of course, hemmed in by the fact that the WTO wants a thoroughly multilateral agreement, which would require an extraordinary amount of consensus among a huge number of states. Uh, and ICSID, of course, uh, is understandably focused on making ICSID and investment arbitration along with mediation and fact-finding, again, how to handle disputes when they arise. That's what its charge is. Uh, so we know what ICSID's mandate is, and I think it's adhering to it. But let's start with you, uh, Professor Calameda. How, do we sh how should we even think about these distinct places for reform? That's an excellent question. I'm not sure that I have. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer on it. I, I think one thing that we see out of the current process and and all of the different places in which reform is being discussed and being dealt with, I think what that leads to the conclusion is that this this will remain a fragmented uh, regime um, even after all of these reform efforts. Um, at the moment, we are principally focused on dispute settlement reform in terms of um, actual ongoing concrete reform efforts in UNCITRAL and in, in an ICSID. Um, in terms of substance, multilateral substantive, substantive, substantive reform is not on the table um, in the similar concrete <clears throat> way. Um, and it doesn't seem to be likely that this will happen anytime soon. Some members of Working Group 3, notably Indonesia and Thailand, have complained or, or offered the, the concern that to do one, to do reform of disputes without reform of substance is, is not really the way to go, but it's not, uh, that's not the focus of the Working Group. I mean, my sense in terms of the interaction between the exit process and the UNCITRA process is that it's rather smooth and, and I, we have the secretary general here so she could tell us better, but I mean, there seems to be a, a, a good coordination between these two bodies. I dare say it's a closer coordination than at least I've observed um, between UNCITRAL and UNCTAD, uh, for example, in, in terms of the work that those two bodies are doing. I mean, with respect to the WTO process, I mean, Cliff and I have actually co-authored a, a piece with, with George Berman and Carl Savant about the potential un unintended interaction between investment facilitation commitments in the WTO and- Could you put a link to that on, the, on the chat at some point so people have a link to that? It is a great piece. Sure, we will we'll do. Um, and I mean, and that's notwithstanding the WTO's disclaimer that it's not dealing with ISDS, it's not dealing with investment protection, but there can be unintended consequences and interactions between these regimes. Um, I mean, within the UNCITRAL and, and ICSID regimes again, or discussions again, there are questions about the interaction of any reforms that UNCITRAL might come up with and existing uh, treaties for the enforcement of awards, whether under the New York Convention or under the ICSID Convention. So they're interrelated, there's no getting away from that, but whether or not it leads to a coherent set of reforms, I think is very much in, in doubt. Hopefully we can, they're not gonna be in conflict. I think that would be an achievement. Just a yes or no, uh, Professor Calamito, and a follow-up question that's come up, which is, do you see Working Group 3 actually adding additional items? It seems like you have a packed agenda in Working Group 3 as it is uh, from now until 2026, but do you actually see additional items being added to the reform agenda of Working Group 3? I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't get that sense, but the rubrics are already pretty broad, so there's space to subsume a lot of things. Okay. So, uh, Meg, do you want to revisit any of the questions we just uh, raised, especially the interaction between reform places? Yeah, exactly. No, it's a very good question. Obviously, we've been watching it. Um, I think we're pretty good in terms of the, the discussions at UNCITRAL and the discussions at ICSID are pretty consistent on almost all topics. I think the one place where there was a, perhaps a different approach has been the current UNCITRAL paper on third-party funding and the ICSID approach. We haven't had or heard a discussion at UNCITRAL on that yet, but otherwise I think they're very, very consistent. 
One of the things though that I think is really important is that as we've looked at the ICSID system and put the reforms forward, we've looked at this as a whole and a set of rules is a jigsaw puzzle. And if one piece doesn't fit, the whole puzzle doesn't go together. So I hope that there won't be too many sort of one-off, everybody will have to do this on this specific piece of procedure that will cause that kind of problem, not just to the ICSID rules, but to any other rules that are doing ISDS. Right now, it doesn't look like that will be a big issue, but I think it's really important. The other big thing I think at this point is it's time to get some concrete results, which is why we are hoping that we can get the results. Obviously, we are a procedural reform, but being able to make progress on that hopefully frees up resources, intellectual and otherwise, to be working on the other pieces. And I hope in particular that it's not just the structural pieces, but that we can get to go to um, maybe substantive reform at some point. But in particular, going back to making sure that ISDS is effective, fit for purpose, what it was do, you know, done for in the first place. Because there are a lot of needs. You look at the G7 statement yesterday, there's a huge need for private investment in climate, environment, health, all of those issues. So also let's not forget the roots of all of this. So. And getting to those roots is I think UNCTAD's calling card, Hamid. Uh, you, you have emphasized, unlike the folks on ISDS reform, the need to uh, use these treaties and national laws and regulations to promote sustainable development, that is also encourage capital flows and not just protect the right to regulate. Do you wanna say anything more about the interaction between your efforts and those in ICSID or in working group three? Uh, thank you, professor. No, I think we're all on the same, uh, the same boat, uh, which is basically how to ensure how to attract investments that contribute to the SDG. Um, at the same time, how to ensure that it is done, uh, that ISDS is fit for purpose, as Meg just, uh, just mentioned. So the idea from, from our perspective, and I think from everybody's perspective, is how to find a win-win relationship, that investors are protected, um, but that the legal framework is not only or solely about this, that it reflects a certain balance. And this balance is, um, it can be done by, by, by different ways in the national laws, in the international treaties, uh, to avoid situations where the state is surprised by uh, an, a kind of asset that it was not intending to protect. And by the way, um, when you don't cover an investor in your or an investment in your BIT, it does not mean that you don't want that investment. You, uh, you can have a very open uh, framework liberalizing different kinds of um, um, attracting investment, but uh, including or covering certain kinds of investments in your BIT is a step on top of that. So um, I don't know if I can get my message across is that uh, you can be uh, welcoming to investment, uh, have an open framework to, to investment at the national level, but decide in your IIAs access to ISDS to cover only certain kinds of investors that fit your national development strategies. In French, they say la cerise sur le gâteau, which means you have the cake and then you want to give the cherry but the cherry is not the main dish. Yeah. Thanks and so I, much. Yeah, um, and so, I, yeah that's... Uh, so we only have a few minutes left. We do have some questions on the Q&A and um, apart from everybody wanting the PowerPoints, which I hope we can uh, provide, Cliff, do, uh, do we have your permission as well? Yes, of, of course. I'm happy. So uh, we will put up those PowerPoints soon, but the next uh, top question is, how far can accountability responsibility be implemented in terms of BITs uh, when we're talking about human rights and the environment? Um, uh, I suspect all of you have something to say about that. Uh, anybody want to volunteer to be first? Human rights, environment. Uh, Hamid, perhaps you want to say something on that? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor. I, I think it's an excellent question, but it is a very difficult one uh, to answer. Uh, 
uh, in our investment policy framework? Uh, well, I think just very briefly, the initial idea of a DIT, the initial concept of a DIT was not uh, to include non-economic issues. That was the, the initial, it was really uh, to protect investors uh, because it was in a different age, different era, different interests, which was very normal um, uh, to have it that way, 10 pages of inve pure investment protection. But now that the world is changing, all these other issues are coming up and the idea, the, the question is how to integrate them without diluting the investment protection in them. And that's the, the famous balance we are trying to reach. Uh, in the investment policy framework, for example, we would typically recommend addressing these issues in the provisions on investor obligations and responsibilities that they should uh, re um, respect human rights, they should not degrade the environment in their investment operations, and then there are different uh, levels. Um, you can go to the level of denying treaty protection, for example, for non-complying investors. Um, we have in the investment policy framework different levels. Uh, another option I see here is of is uh, is uh, to provide th that non-compliance by investors may be should be considered by the tribunal when interpreting fair and equitable treatment, for example. There, are, but uh, yeah, so there are different options. Um, we don't have a clear one formula fits all, but we have different policy options that range from softer to more legally binding. Uh, unless anybody else wants to address the human rights environmental uh, question, we have a well, question. Yes. Well, I just want to quickly jump in. I think it's really important uh, to displace that idea that ISDS is anti-environment. In fact, we need private investment in a lot of these environmental industries that are coming up, etc. And why this whole idea of having human rights and other issues has come up is because we've got both an effective system, but an effective enforcement system. So you can incorporate the human rights and other aspects, but I think we're still working on doing that with some specificity so it can be done well. And in particular, we'll have to get our heads around what kind of remedies. Pecuniary damages is not necessarily the most effective remedy where you have a concern about human rights. So there's still thinking to be done, but I think there's a lot of potential. Indeed, uh, you reminded me that one of the most uh, interesting to me uh, investment reports issued by UNCTAD was on mitigating climate change and the important role that uh, private flows of capital uh, are needed uh, to mitigate climate change. So certainly that side, if investment agreements are effective at uh, encouraging capital flows and directing them at specific places, which the investment facilitation uh, approach would do it, then it is, it's part of the solution and not always uh, the problem. We have a question that has not come up in our discussion so far. Uh, uh, unilateral sanctions on both trade and investment are occurring uh, for a number of countries. Uh, in the WTO, as Cliff knows, we've had the famous Russia-Ukraine case. How should we think about unilateral sanctions in terms of the reforms of this regime? Uh, if anybody wants to volunteer on that. Cliff, it might be your turn on <laughs> this one. Thank you, Jose. Uh, this is really uh, some, some uh, I, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, unilateral sanctions um, within the uh, dispute settlement. I mean, in the WTO, of course, um, uh, there, there have been discussions with regard to national security exception. Um, so uh, those were, uh, I mean, unilateral sanctions were deemed as a kind of uh, background for these uh, uh, invocation of these kind of um, uh, treaty clause in the WTO dispute settlement. Uh, of course, in, in investment treaty arbitration, uh, we did have um, a, a number of cases, especially you're an expert in that uh, Argentina cases with regard to uh, security uh, issues or, um, but I think unilateral sanctions um, uh, for the reform, uh, well, well I, I, I think for the reform of, of uh, dispute settlement, I, I would say uh, more like in the substance way, because I, I believe that the countries nowadays would uh, uh, very carefully balance uh, state regulatory uh, power, 
on the one side and, in, and protection of foreign investment. And uh, I believe Meg and Hamid already uh, discussed very extensively. So I think this might be uh, the field. I, I sense that the, uh, the issue of unilateral sanctions uh, would uh, probably uh, to be fitted in uh, the discussion with ISDS. Thank you. Yes, Professor Kalamino. I just to, to note, I, to the extent that states are taking unilateral sanctions um, as purported countermeasures for other wrongs that the, the, the target state has taken, we, we've seen in the Mexican sugar high fructose corn syrup cases that it's not a very easy defense at all for the state to make out to claim that it's treated investors in a certain way as a countermeasure to something that the investor's home state has done. I mean, as Cliff mentioned, there are increasing essential security provisions and treaties, but even though there, my sense is that most of them deal with measures that are taken pursuant to things like UN resolutions as opposed to unilateral uh, sanctions. So they're very likely justiciable as potential claims. Indeed, and the WTO, even when it looked like it was going to be a self-judging essential security clause, there was some pushback by the panels to say, well, actually, we can take another look at what you think is a crisis. They upheld them in the case of Russia, Ukraine, but still there was a warning there. Now, we have a, a, a question about India and its approach to ISDS, and I think, Ahmed, you may have mentioned India's uh, 2016 model uh, treaty. Um, how influential is it and how would you describe India's approach? Um, yeah, thank you. Well, India, India's approach is, um, is one that uh, of reflection, uh, reconsideration and recalibration. Um, they, they have decided to reconsider uh, their old BITs um, to develop a model um, um, as a result of, of, of extensive uh, domestic consultation process, as I understand, uh, was developed and put online. Um, and I think it reflects what uh, India wants. It's, it's a policy choice. Every country has a policy choice to refine and uh, draft, craft provisions the way they want. Um, um, there's also another question I see here mentioning Brazil, for example, which has signed the cooperation and facilitation investment agreements, which does not have any ISDS, but a state-state dispute settlement mechanism. Um, we also know that Brazil, of course, attracts very high levels of FDI. So uh, in the Indian model, uh, of course, in terms of how feasible it is to renegotiate with a different party exactly all of the Indian model or for that matter most countries it will be very difficult to of course put the whole model and and ask the other party to just sign on here so I think it's it's a good model I think it's a model it's good because it reflects what the country wants to achieve and the fact that they went through um, 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 a lot of research uh, and discussions is already a very uh, encouraging uh, step. Um, so I have no position on the content of the model itself. I just think the process of developing a model is a very encouraging one. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question on something else that hasn't come up, which is uh, a growing uh, possibility that uh, COVID will generate uh, claims, including in, under ISDS. So I, I, I wanna tee it up, especially if Meg, uh, do you anticipate a bunch of COVID cases? Are they already starting to emerge? Um, will this affect the fifth uh, rules amendment process <laughs> at some point? Um, it's an interesting question and we've been hearing this ever since uh, COVID hit us all. <clears throat> I am not aware, uh, and there were predictions of all sorts of COVID claims. I'm not aware of any ISDS COVID claims yet. I know of one claim that's been made in the early stages, which is basically a contract claim and about a concession uh, and the terms changing. I have not heard any kind of the sort of policy questions coming up. And it's an interesting question as to whether we will see those kinds of cases. Cases usually take a good sort of 
two to three years to mature after whatever the events in question are. But I think we're looking at a different world now where we've had a lot of clarification about regulatory power and police power, uh, a reaffirmation time and time again that there's a broad margin of deference to states and they simply need a reasonable basis upon which to legislate. So I would expect to see, if anything, more of the contract type case and force majeure type defense than the sort of regular ISDS uh, policy challenge that we've seen. And certainly in ISDS, we're way behind many domestic courts where they've already seen a start in the so-called COVID cases. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of, of time, but there was one question that I hope comes up uh, in one of our panels uh, in the next uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, which is a contrast between the WTO's discussion of judicial uh, lawmaking uh, and how do you restrict that, which is being discussed more broadly in the WTO, especially as part of uh, perhaps making the appellate body work again, uh, and the apparent absence of such discussion in, as I understand it, either ICSID or Working Group 3. That is, no discussion of how to hem in um, arbitral uh, decisions, except through joint interpretations by the parties, but nothing about what is the proper role of adjudicators, what is the proper role of judicial lawmaking, uh, as if there's anything to be said for that. Unfortunately, uh, you, your group won't be responsible for that, but if you're inclined to uh, put an answer to that on the uh, chat box for when this shows up on the recording, otherwise, uh, hopefully it'll come up uh, on tomorrow's or Wednesday's or even Thursday's session. Uh, to the extent I have anything to do with it, I will be pushing that question, I, I can assure you. Uh, with that, I thank you all for this marvelous uh, presentation, and I turn it back uh, to uh, Stephanie. Thank you for this fantastic first discussion, and dear participants, thank you once again for being with us. The recording of this session can be found on the CIL Facebook page, and it will also be uploaded on the CIL webpage very soon. We hope to see you tomorrow for session two. Goodbye, good evening, have a nice day, see you, bye. Bye.